There are many motivations for studying networks. One of the most important motivations is to understand how network structure affects processes that happen within networks. The spread of disease through a population, surfing the web, cricket choirs, the transport of people and goods, even thought itself. These are all processes that take place on networks and the structure and evolution of those networks shape these processes. Any of these networks we study have a purpose, and typically the purpose implies that there's information, money, messages, whatever you want to name it, flowing along the links of these networks. We always thought dynamics was really the problem, not the graph theory. Graph theory was just a stepping stone to asking the more important question, which is how does the behavior of a system change or depend on the way it's connected. The spread of disease is getting harder to contain. The ease of modern travel has created global pathways through which infectious agents, such as HIV, can infest entire populations. Network scientists are contributing to the fight against HIV and other deadly diseases through the study of epidemiology. Epidemiological models describe how diseases diffuse through a population. Network scientists have refined these models by incorporating network structure, including the effects of disease pathways created by transport, social interaction, and sexual contact. Basically, a, a person's risk of getting infected is just um, kind of proportional to the number of infected neighbors that they have. Now if I'm asking you about epidemiology, so I'm interested in spread of diseases on human social networks, what I want is to eliminate connectivity. So if diseases are spreading, I want to contain them. So I want to break the network up into small little clumps. People have started to do quite large-scale studies of the structure of these contact networks so that we could use that as input to calculations of how diseases spread through communities. The study of epidemiology on networks is providing scientists with a better picture of how diseases flow through real societies and showing doctors how to distribute vaccines more effectively. Similar models are also teaching network scientists about the resilience of infrastructure. In 1996, a cascading failure in the power grid of the western United States left homes, businesses, and hospitals without power for days. The same kinds of models used in disease diffusion also show how failures can propagate through technological networks, helping engineers understand how to make their designs more robust. What often you'll be measuring is how connected is the network after this attack? Or how many nodes do you have to remove, for example, to disconnect most of the network? As you might expect, if you have a very skewed degree distribution with these hubs, then if you do a targeted attack, you're going to take out the hubs and you're going to do very great damage to the network. And on the other hand, if you're doing a random attack, then these scale-free networks are going to be remarkably robust because a large um, fraction of the nodes are actually not that well connected. Network scientists have generated a wealth of information about the effects of network structure on various phenomena. Much of this information is stored on yet another network, the World Wide Web. Ironically, it is another network process that allows us to find this information, search. Search is one of the most familiar processes on networks. Most people search the web many times a day. But the web is complex. Without clever algorithms for finding information within its tangle of pages and hyperlinks, the web would be useless. That's like solving a maze, and not even a maze where you have an aerial view of it, but a maze where you're in it. And, and that's still behind a lot of our intuition about the web, that we're browsing it, that we're exploring it. But of course, if you think about your actual interactions with the web, it consists now a lot more of being sort of directly teleported to where you're trying to go thanks to search engines. In 1998, two graduate students at Stanford University, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, 
decided to tackle the problem of making the web searchable. Their solution was Google. Google was unlike the search engines that came before it. It was the first to truly exploit the network structure of the web. Earlier search engines, or web crawlers, would crawl through the entire World Wide Web, creating local indexes of information. The web crawlers would rank sites in the list based on the quality of the information and direct queries to the highly ranked pages. Google does the same thing with one twist. It includes the site's popularity, or degree, in its ranking. By counting the links to sites and adjusting their ranking, Google exploited the link structure of the web to enrich its search capability. The web, were it not hyperlinked, would be essentially unsearchable for all these reasons. It's really the links that let you figure out the role of any particular web page in, in the collection as a whole. The fact that you could learn about a document not only from its content, but maybe even more importantly by how others referred to it. Now, if you have a web crawler, then how are you discovering the different pages? So you're going to find your node um, fairly quickly, just taking advantage of the fact that you have these hubs. The result was a far more efficient search engine. In the initial test, Google's algorithm outperformed the existing search algorithms significantly. Ten years later, it's almost impossible to imagine life without Google. Today, people can find an excess of information on any topic instantaneously. Thanks to network know-how, the world is wired. I don't know if we really know why networks are navigable. It sometimes seems like a nice coincidence that they are. Almost any process you can think of is affected by network structure. Even thought itself is a process on a network, taking place within a complex web of neural pathways. If Descartes were alive today, he might say, I think, therefore, I network. Only recently have scientists begun to unravel the interplay between network structure and processes. In the following lesson, you'll learn about some of these processes and some of the techniques developed to understand them.